H.P. Lovecraft, Reanimator, Chapter 2. I shall never forget that hideous summer sixteen years ago, when, like a noxious afrit from the halls of Iblis, typhoid stalked leeringly through Arkham. It is by that satanic scourge that most recall the year. For truly terror brooded with bat wings over the piles of coffins in the tombs of Christchurch Cemetery. Yet for me there is a greater horror in that time, a horror to me known alone now that Herbert West has disappeared. West and I were doing postgraduate work in summer classes at the medical school of Missatonic University, and my friend had attained a wide notoriety because of experiments leading toward the revivification of the dead. After the scientific slaughter of uncounted small animals, the freakish work had sustainably stopped by order of our own skeptical dean. Dr. Alan Halsey Though Wes had continued to perform certain secret tests in his dingy boarding house room, and had one terrible and unforgettable occasion taken a human body from its grave in the potter's field to a deserted farmhouse beyond Meadow Hill. I was with him on that odious occasion, and saw him eject into the still veins the elixir which he would thought to some extent restore life's chemical and physical processes. It had ended quite horribly, in a delirium of fear which we gradually came to attribute to our own overwrought nerves, and West had never afterward been able to shake off a maddening sensation of being haunted and hunted. The body had not been quite fresh enough. It is obvious that to restore normal mental attributes, a muddy body must be very fresh indeed. <clears throat> and a burning of the old house had prevented us from burying the thing. It would have been better if we could have known it was underground. After that experience, West had dropped his researches for some time. But as the zeal of the born scientist slowly returned, he again became importunate with the college faculty pleading for the use of the dissecting room and of fresh human specimens for the work he regarded as so overwhelmingly important. His pleas, however, were wholly in vain, for the decision of Dr. Halsley was inflexible, and the other professors all endorsed the verdict of their leader. In the radical theory of reanimation they saw nothing but the immature vagaries of a youthful enthusiast whose slight form, yellow hair, spectacled blue eyes, and soft voice gave no hint of the supernormal, almost diabolical power of the cold brain within. I can see him now as he was then, and I shiver. He grew sterner of face, but never elderly, and now Stephen Asylum has had the mishap, and West has vanished. West clashed disagreeably with Dr. Halsley near the end of our last undergraduate term, in a wordy dispute that did less credit to him than to the kindly dean in point of courtesy. He felt that he was needlessly and irrationally retarded in a supremely great work, a work which he could, of course, conduct to suit himself in later years, but which he wished to begin while still possessed of the exceptional facilities of the university. That the tradition-bound elders should ignore his singular results on animals and persist in their denial of the possibility of reanimation was inexpressibly disgusting and almost incomprehensible to a youth of West's logical temperament. Only great maturity could help him understand the chronic mental limitations of the professor-doctor type, the product of generations of pathetic paternalism, kindly, consensuous, and sometimes gentle and amiable, yet always very narrow and tolerant and custom-ridden, and lacking in any true perspective. Age has more charity for those incomplete yet high-souled characters, whose worst real vice is timidity and who ultimately punished by general ridicule for their intellectual sins. Sins like Ptolemasia, Calvinism, and anti-Darwinism, anti-Nietzscheism, and every soul of Sabbatarianism and sumptuary legislation. West, who was young despite his marvelous scientific requirements, had scant patience with good Dr. Halsey and his erudite colleagues, and nursed an increasingly resentment coupled with a desire to prove his theories to those obtuse worthies in some striking and dramatic fashion. Like most youths, he indulged in elaborate daydreams of revenge, triumph, and final magnanism, forgiveness. But then had come the scourging, grinning, and lethal from the nightmare caverns of Tartarus. West and I had graduated about the time of its beginning, 
but it remained for additional work at the summer school, so that as we were in Arkham when it broke with full demonic fury upon the town. Though not as yet licensed physicians, we now had our degrees, and were pressed frantically into public service as the numbers of stricken grew. The situation was almost past management, and deaths ensued too frequently for local undertakers fully to handle. Burials without embalming were made in rapid succession, and even the Christchurch Cemetery receiving tomb was crammed with coffins of the unembalmed dead. This circumstance was not without effect on West who thought often of the irony of the situation. So many, many fresh specimens, yet none for his persecuted researches. We were frightfully overworked, and the terrible mental and nervous strain made my friend brood morbidly. But West's gentle enemies were no less harassed with prostrating duties. College had all but closed, and every doctor of the medical faculty was helping to fight the typhoid plague. Dr. Halsey, in particular, distinguished himself in sacrificing service, applying his extreme skill while wholehearted energy to cases which many others shunned because of the danger or apparent hopelessness. Before a month was over, the fearless dean had become a popular hero, though he seemed unconscious of his fame as he struggled to keep from collapsing with physical fatigue and nervous exhaustion. West could not withhold admiration for the fortitude of his foe, but because of this was even more determined to prove to him the truth of his own amazing doctrines. Taking advantage of the disorganization of both college work and municipal help regulations, he managed to get a recently deceased body smuggled into the university dissecting room one night, and in my presence injected a new modification of a solution. The thing actually opened its eyes, but only stared at the ceiling with a look of soul-petrifying horror before collapsing into an inertness from which nothing could rouse it. West said it was not fresh enough. The hot summer air does not favor corpses. That time we were almost caught before we incinerated the thing, and West doubted the advisability of repeating this daring misuse of the college's laboratory. The peak of the epidemic was reached in August. West and I were almost dead, and Dr. Halsey did die on the 14th. The students all attended the hasty funeral on the 15th, and bought an impressive wreath, though the latter was quite overshadowed by the tribute sent by wealthy Arkham citizens and the municipality itself. It was almost a public affair. For the dean had surely been a public benefactor. After the entombment, we were all somewhat depressed, and spent the afternoon at the bar of the commercial house, where West, though shaken by the death of his chief opponent, chilled the rest of us with references to his notorious theories. Most of the students went home, or to various other duties, and as the evening advanced, but West persuaded me to aid him in making a night of it. West's landlady saw us arrive at his room about two in the morning, with a third man between us, and told her husband that we had all evidently dined and wined rather well. Apparently this audacious matron was right, for about three a.m. the old house was aroused by cries coming from West's room, though when they broke down the door they found the two of us unconscious on the blood-stained carpet, beaten, scratched, and mauled, and with the broken remains of West's bottles and instruments around us. Only an open window told what had become of our assailant, and many wondered how he himself had fared after the terrific leap from the second story to the lawn which he must have made. There were some strange garments in the room, but West, upon gaining consciousness, said they did not belong to the stranger, but were specimens collected for bacteriological analysis in the course of investigating on the transmission of germ diseases. He ordered them burnt as soon as possible in the capricious fireplace. To the police we both declared ignorance of our late companion's identity. He was, West nervously said, a congenial stranger whom we had met at some downtown bar of uncertain location. We had all been rather jovial, and West and I did not wish to have our pugnacy's companion hunted down. That same night saw the beginning of the second Arkham Horror, the horror that to me eclipsed the plague itself. Christchurch Cemetery was the scene of a very, rather terrible killing. A watchman, who was clawed to death in a manner not only too hideous for description, but raising a doubt as to the human agency of the deed. The victim had been seen alive considerably after midnight. The dawn revealed the unutterable thing. The manager of a circus at the neighboring town of Bolton was questioned, but he swore that no beast had at any time escaped from its cages. Those who found the body noted a trail of blood leading to the receiving tomb, where a small pool of red lay on the concrete just outside the gate. A fainter trail led away toward the woods, but it soon gave out. The next night devils danced on the roofs of Arkham, 
an unnatural madness hallowed in the wind. Through the fevered town had crept a curse which some said was greater than the plague, and which some whispered was the embodied demon soul of the plague itself. Eight houses were entered by nameless things, which strewed red death in its wake, and all seventeen maimed and shapeless remains of bodies were left behind by the voiceless, sadistic monster that crept abroad. A few persons had half seen it in the dark, and said it was white and like a malformed ape or anthropomorphic fiend. It had not left behind quite all that it had attacked, for sometimes it had been hungry. The number it had killed was fourteen. Three of the bodies had been in stricken homes and had not been alive. On the third night, frantic bands of searchers, led by the police, captured it in the house on Crane Street, near the Mississippi campus. They had organized the quest with care, keeping in touch by means of volunteer telephone stations, and when someone in the college district had reported hearing a scratching at a shuttered window, the net was quickly spread. On account of the general alarm and precautions, there was only two more victims, and the capture was affected without any major casualties. The thing was finally stopped by a bullet, though not a fatal one, and was rushed to the local hospital and missed universal excitement and loathing. For it had been a man. That much was clear despite the nauseous eyes, the voiceless simoniasm, and the demonic savagery. They dressed its wound and carted it to the asylum at Sefton, where it beat its head against the walls of a padded cell for sixteen years. Well, until the recent mishap, when it escaped under circumstances that few liked to mention. What had most disgusted the searchers of the Arkham was the thing they noticed with the monster's face was cleaned, the mocking, unbelievable resemblance to a learned and self-sacrificing martyr who had been entombed but three days before, the late Dr. Alan Halsey, public benefactor and dean of the medical school of Mississippi University. To the Van Sherbert West, and to me the disgust and horror were supreme. I shudder tonight as I think of it. Shudder even more than I did that morning when West muttered through his bandages, Damn it, it wasn't quite fresh enough.